Thanks very much. I'm really happy to be here, and it's it's um, it's great to be able to share some ideas with you. And and fundamentally, that's what this talk is about. I I certainly have some data and a little bit of research from our group and some others to to share with you. But um, I always try to take full advantage of these keynote opportunities to have some license to be a bit of a provocateur, and that's what I was. Uh, trying to do when I came up with the title of this particular talk, that science turn in physical literacy is the field shifting and why. So sometimes when I give a talk, I wait till the end to tie everything together, but I'm going to do something a little bit different today, for me anyways. I'm going to give you what I was thinking of at the beginning and then, and then walk you through some evidence that supports the claim, I hope. Um, I always begin with important disclosures. Um, usually they're, 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 they're financial, which takes me about 10 seconds because I really don't have any financial disclosures to, to state. But in this particular case, my disclosure is uh, my co-partners uh, in crime, if you will, on, in the physical literacy space. And I suspect these faces are familiar to, to many people in the audience. I don't know if Dean Creelars actually knows that we have a f shot of him in a cowboy hat with a, with a rope, but we do. And Dean Dudley, who is a professor at Macquarie University, who you will hear later in the week uh, give a keynote on physical literacy as a learning construct. Both of these gentlemen, among others, but these two in particular, have ex significantly influenced my, my thinking in this area. And I'm particularly grateful to Dean uh, Creelars, who went first in the group of keynotes, and I know you now know what the definition of physical literacy is, and, and I generally subscribe to what Dean describes, so I, I, I have the advantage of not having to begin the talk by defining physical literacy, because I think you all have a good sense of uh, what we think of it and, and, and how we position it. So what did I mean by a science turn? Well. A couple of things, and they all sort of flow together in, 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 in many ways. Um, there was a paper written by uh, Laurie Edwards and colleagues uh, about a year ago, a little more than a year ago. Uh, a couple of papers, actually. One was a review of definitions and foundations for definitions. The other was a, a review of measures. And one of the things that they, they talked about in the paper was the importance of declaring one's philosophical underpinnings or philosophical orientation to the field of physical literacy. And they identified two. Um, I'm not entirely sure I agree with the characterization, and I know, um, I know Nigel's in here somewhere. I'm not sure he would agree with it necessarily either, but we'll go with it for the time being. They distinguish between idealistic and pragmatic approaches to the problem. And fundamentally, what that meant was a more philosophical orientation to particularly the conceptual definition of physical literacy, driven largely by uh, Margaret Whitehead's work and, and, and her colleagues, versus a pragmatic approach, which um, I actually think had more to do with empiricism than it had to do exclusively with pragmatics. So one is a philosophical approach, one is an empirical, or what I would say equates to a scientific approach. So when I talk about a scientific turn or a scientific approach, what I fundamentally mean is a pragmatic approach in the context of the Edwards paper, and, and what I think is a science-based approach really to seek basic questions around uh, the empirical understanding of, of physical literacy. And I don't claim to be a philosopher of science, and I don't claim to have to, the, to convince anyone that this is an appropriate characterization. I just wanted you to get a sense of where I was coming from in all of this. Why? So if there has been a scientific term, which in this context would mean more attention, particularly recently, to the pragmatic or empirical side of inquiry into physical literacy, what is driving this turn, if it, if it in fact is a turn? And I think fundamentally it comes down to a desire for a pursuit of evidence. And the evidence, I think, pragmatically, simply means, is there such a thing as physical literacy? Can we measure it? If so, do we have reliable and valid approaches to be able to do that, or at least tools or measures that produce valid and reliable results? And I think people are also interested in intervention-based questions, which are evidence-based questions. If we use a physical literacy approach, does it produce positive impacts in the way that we would um, um, hope it would or hypothesize it would? 
all I mean by a science term. I have always found Margaret's work foundational for my own thinking in, in physical literacy. I think Margaret's papers, this is one example of a paper she wrote many years ago. There are others and there are books. Um, this was my first foyer into the field of physical literacy. Margaret was my first connection to physical literacy. And I appreciated her perspective. I thought the academic rigor and the scholarly rigor that went into the construction of the physical literacy paradigm that she was putting forward was fascinating. And I still use, I still go back to it and reflect on the ideas that Margaret discussed. And I think sitting in a, in, in a room full of people today and having been to sessions and listened to previous keynotes, Margaret's influence continues to be extremely important in the field. However, at the same time, it would be wrong to say that Margaret coined the term physical literacy, which is something I heard very, very, first IL, uh, IPLC meeting I ever went to, people said Margaret Whitehead created f physical literacy. Well, no, that's not true. Physical literacy as a term has been around for a lot, long, long time. As far back as the 1800s, at least, is where we sort of began to date it in a paper that we've written recently called A 20th Century Narrative on the Origins of the Concept. What I think Margaret did, which none of these other references that we could find did, was position physical literacy in a very particular framework, one informed by existentialism and monism as philosophical approaches and elaborated upon that and discussed the implications of it and wrote a very rigorous scholarly treatise on that. But it's my position that that's one interpretation of physical literacy. It's not the only interpretation of physical literacy. And I think if we are to evolve and survive as an academic discipline, we need to embrace multi-perspectives and multiple disciplinary approaches to the understanding of what is a very complicated multi-dimensional construct or concept. That does not in any way diminish the contributions that Margaret has made and will continue to make to the field. It simply says, I it, I'm simply saying I believe we need to embrace a, a, a broader perspective or at least one that uh, uh, provides alternative uh, definitions and conceptualizations. And so if we look at some of the early special editions that have come out in the collected works, uh, we see a heavy influence of um, that, what I sometimes refer to as a Whiteheadian perspective on physical literacy. And that's not at all surprising, given the important contributions she made in the evolution of the, of the concept. Where I think we've seen a bit of a turn, though, is uh, the special edition that uh, Dean Dudley and I were able to, were th able to along with Jackie Goodway, uh, be section editors for the Journal of Teaching and Physical Education. And we specifically said in the most recent edition, which came out just this past year, special edition, that we, we were interested in emphasizing where the field was in terms of evidence around intervention and other kinds of empirical work. And so it signaled, I think, a very different approach than the special edition that was, came out not a year before it. Right? So already we're beginning to see a bit of a, of a shift. Um, before I go to measurement, I would also say that I had the pleasure of uh, attending a, a session this morning by uh, our colleagues from Denmark, who also seem to be embracing a kind of scientific turn in physical literacy. I, I could certainly talk about uh, Mark Tremblay's work on the Canadian Assessment Physical Literacy Tool. I'll mention it a little bit under measurement, and that would be another example of an empirical approach to measurement in physical literacy. Uh, there's an Australian group here as well from Western Australia who's also interested in doing this work, and I'm missing people um, in saying that. And I hope I get a chance at some point throughout this uh, gathering to meet with those of you who may be interested in doing this kind of work and learning more about what it is that you want to do. Okay, so if we, if we take this as um, some evidence that if it's not a turn, at least it's a broadening or branching, branching out of a, a, a heavy emphasis on the idealism to something that's becoming much more pragmatic and empirical. And what do we know then, or what work has been done around the idea of conceptualization and measurement of physical literacy? Asking questions like, can it be measured? Um, how best to measure it? Um, will it be a hybrid set of approaches where we use existing measures and sort of call them together and call it physical literacy, or are we in a position to develop our own tools that specifically measure um, the construct in, in its multiple dimensions? Uh, I've always thought that before we even get there, 
we have to have, and this is how a pragmatist or an empiricist thinks, so you're getting insight into how we think in this perspective, is what's the evidence that, that these things that we've thrown together linguistically actually relate to one another in a statistical sense? You know, do we have ev any evidence to suggest that in some sense the, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole? Is there something about the unity of the construct that isn't just a combination of things that we've already known about for a long time, motor competence, psychological constructs. Is there anything in the unity that's of interest? And we tried to do this in this paper by using existing da data because we don't have yet, or we didn't at the time anyways, have a comprehensive data set that had multiple measures that fully captured the complexity of, of the physical literacy construct. But we did have some data that had domains that were related to it. And, and some of it comes from earlier work that I've, I've done. It was a longitudinal study of about 2,200 children in grade four, and we followed them every single year till they went into high school. Um, so it was a large enough sample that we could do some of the statistical modeling that's required to answer this question. Um, this isn't actually using all of the eight waves. It's only using the data when the children were in grade four and again when they were in grade six. But what we tried to do was, was test a model that would be consistent with Margaret's conceptualization as well as others like Colin Hicks and other people who've written in this area. We explicitly excluded physical activity and fitness measures because we don't believe those are part of the physical literacy construct. They are themselves constructs which are related to physical literacy. And we did the modeling, I guess I got it wrong, we did the modeling in grade five and grade seven. And so what we ended up with was a, a, a best that we could do model based on the data that we had. We were able to measure some uh, degree of motor competence or motor ability. We had motivational items from survey-based questions that tapped into the motivational domain. And we had some items that tapped into affect, particularly enjoyment of physical activity. What we weren't able to do is get to the knowledge and, and, and self-awareness construct. And you know, we had discussions about this early on um, in previous sessions. I think in many ways this is the toughest domain to measure because it's the one I think we have the least amount of agreement on what it actually is that we're measuring. Well, I'll tell you what I don't think it is. I don't think it's knowledge of physical activity guidelines and healthy eating. I don't think that's what Margaret was getting at at all and I don't think that's really uh, what the knowledge domain of physical literacy is. I think we'll get more insight from, from Dean's lecture when he talks about it as a learning construct. More than just knowing, it's the embodiment of knowledge that comes from movement-based experiences. But we don't have that in the data, so we're limited. We don't claim this to be a comprehensive test of a physical literacy model, but it pushes the boulder just a little bit further up the hill. And what's interesting about this from a statistical perspective, and if this is pragmatic perspective, is we were able to show that these things actually do come together to form an unobserved or latent construct that's consistent with physical literacy. That's what the circles and lines mean, and the CFI and the REMC and the TFI are just statistics that tell us when you model the data this way, it actually works in an empirical sense. Now, what does that tell me as a researcher? It tells me that there may be something to this, that these are not just separate concepts, but that they do flow together um, in, in ways that are predictable from our hypotheses about the association between these constructs. That's important from a scientific perspective. And it holds in grade five and holds in grade seven, so it's developmentally stable, at least over a relatively short but important developmental period. What was also kind of cool was we then took all of those items that we put together into this general model and tried to predict physical activity. And the construct of physical literacy that we were able to derive actually accounted for 45% of the vari variability in self-reported physical activity, meaning children who scored higher in this hypothetical model of physical literacy also were more active. And the comparator point for us was just to take a single measure of motor competence or motor proficiency that we use quite commonly in the literature called the brunick sosteretsky test of motor proficiency, and it only accounted for 18% of the variance in physical activity. Self-reported, of course. 
So right away, and it shouldn't be rocket science really, obviously when we have social, effective, motivational, motor, competence-based measures together, we're going to explain more of the phenomenon. The really important part is they hang together in a way that's predictable from our conceptualization of, of physical literacy. So we were able to produce empirically a model of physical literacy that includes motor competence, motivation, and positive appact, and we were able to find support for that statistically. And it seems to suggest that maybe it is more than the sum of the individual parts. There is a holistic construct that sits on top of all these things that's consistent with our understanding of physical literacy. Maybe that doesn't excite the general audience, but it certainly excites the scientists because we say, maybe we can measure this thing. Maybe it's possible. We're seeing evidence that suggests that may be so. Well, we've gone on from there and done um, a number of different studies that have looked at out specifically not trying to construct models of physical literacy, but to do evaluations of, of other measures that purport to measure this concept. And, and one of them are the play tools that uh, Dean Krelars uh, was the architect of at, at the University of Manitoba. Play self, play inventory, play parent, play coach. But in particular, we started with play fun, which is an interesting measure of the motor competence domain of physical literacy. It's neat in a bunch of different ways. I'm not fully sure that Dean knew exactly what he was doing, because I, I don't know that he does, but he's, he's a mad scientist, and he was able to come up with something that was, I think, a significant improvement over existing measures of motor competence. The biggest one being that he chose a holistic rubric for classification of children that relied upon observation of tasks and used a scoring system that technically ranged from zero to 100. From a statistical point of view, that's an incredible achievement if you can pull it off, at, uh, if you can pull it off and it works. Um, most of our measures of motor proficiency categorize children into big bins, proficient, not proficient. And when you think about that, how much information is lost by categorizing people with that blunt a system, then there's an interesting idea here with, with, with the play tool, play fun tool in particular. If he's right, if this makes sense, then we can capture far more variability in movement experiences than we can with existing tools. Therefore, our correlations with things like physical activity and other outcomes should be higher. So we did something very similar with, with a different data set, entirely different data set of children, 126 from after school programs in the province of Ontario. You can see the age range and the uh, sex breakdown there. I won't go into the detail of it, but this is a different data set than the one I showed previously. And what we were able to do was say, does the factor structure of play fun make sense in the way that Dean conceptualized it? Do the items that measure locomotion, do the items that measure balance, do the objects that measure motor control cluster together? Do they correlate with one another more strongly than items that measure different things? And then from a pragmatist, from a scientific measurement perspective, this is a critical thing to establish. And we were able to show, much like we were with the construct validation paper, that that was in fact true. I don't expect you to be able to read all of the individual coefficients, but what that diagram is telling us is that there are classes within play fun, and the items that Dean thought measured object control do seem to measure object control. And the evidence and the statistics point its way there. While we were doing this, colleagues at the University of Alberta were doing almost exactly the same thing with Play Fun and Play Basic, which is the smaller version of Play Fun, on a northern Alberta population. Very, very different group of kids, but essentially they came to the same conclusions. Not only did they find support for the factor structure, but they also reported inter-rater agreement and uh, inter-rater agreement for both the scales and correlations of the play fun and play basic skill, uh, skill res results, scale results with physical activity, which again would be consistent with our expectations that higher performance on the motor competence scales leads to greater physical activity. I won't talk about CAPEL very much, only to say that, as most of you know by now, I don't think it truly captures all of the, con the domains within the concept of physical literacy. I think what it does is give a very broad set of measures that measure a bunch of things, physical activity, fitness, some motivational domains, 
and a kind of motor competence that's a little bit different than the traditional way by which we measure motor competence. But it's undeniable that they have probably done more research than anybody else in the field in validating their tool. There was an entire edition of the journal BMC Public Health that was dedicated to a study of more than 10,000 children across Canada using the CAPL tool. I believe PJ Naylor, who might be here somewhere, was one of the editors of that journal. So there's absolutely quite a lot of empirical work on this, on this concept, even though I have some issues with it. We developed something called the Preschool Physical Literacy Assessment Tool to address the gap in assessing physical literacy beyond the age or lower than the age of eight, which is where both the CAPL and Play Fun begin. So we were interested in a, a seeing whether we could come up with an approach that was robust enough to begin to assess physical literacy in children uh, in preschool, in particular ages four or five, or in kindergarten, in very early years of development. And we uh, stole some ideas, while Dean was one of the, the authors of it, we stole some ideas from Play Fun. We used a kind of modified a visual analog rubric like he did for uh, Play Fun, so we had a theoretically scores that ranged from zero to 100. But the big difference in this tool is that it's entirely rated by early childhood educators. So what we ask them to do is observe the children in naturalistic settings for a minimum of two weeks. We don't ask them to intervene, we just ask them to observe. We do ask that they maximize possibility to see the children in different settings and different times of day and all of those other things. They're trained on how to approach the observation period, but we don't have them directly assess children. They watch and they're trained to look for certain things. And then we have them rate the children on a bunch of different items using a rubric that actually is modified from a learning construct that Dean Dudley uses in, called the solo taxonomy. The language is different because it needed to be appropriate for ECEs. But essentially, we're interested in getting them to rate children's physical literacy in that developmental period. And we don't look for things like proper overhand throw. We, we look for sending skills and receiving skills and tumbling and rolling and all basic movement competencies and whether the child is beginning to put those movement competencies together and do creative things or whether they still very much rely on adults to encourage them and, and instruction to move. We also get them to rate motivation, which is incredibly difficult to do because you really can't rate somebody's motivation entirely from behavior, but it's folly to ask a four-year-old about their self-competence with regard to anything. Uh, the, the good news is they'll say they're great at everything. The sad thing is they change over time. They become less confident in their abilities. So we had a study of about 78 children. We looked at inter-rater agreements, so we wanted to be sure that the ECEs, if they're rating the same child, would agree with each other, and we wanted to see whether it correlated with things that made sense, like measures of physical activity. So we used accelerometry to measure physical activity behaviors in the children. And what we saw was actually quite interesting. From an agreement point of view, pretty good. The ECEs agreed with one another when they were rating children. Sometimes a little bit better for boys than girls, but overall in an acceptable range. And we saw it both intra and inter-rater agreement was strong. When we looked at the physical activity data, that's where we saw something that, that, that we weren't happy about. The dotted line on the bottom represents girls and the solid line represents boys. And basically, as you move from the part of the graph where x and y axis intercept to the other end, you should see a line that's going up, theoretically. It would suggest higher scores on pre-play, which is better physical literacy, would be associated with greater levels of physical activity directly measured. What you see there is that that's true for girls, but for boys, it's flat. So it suggested to us that we needed to do much more training with our ECEs on physical literacy and sex-based differences in play in boys. And that's exactly what we're working on now. I'll talk in the last few minutes that I have about intervention. And what's some of the work that we're doing around using principles of physical literacy for purposes of intervention. One of the Neater studies that I've been involved in in the past few years has been the circus-based art study that's really work that Dean has been leading along with Patrice from the National Circus School in Montreal. Those are pictures of Cirque du Soleil. Patrice actually isn't in any of those pictures, uh, nor is Dean. But we did look at 
you don't want to see them in spam. Well, maybe you do, yes. Um, this was looking at basically a study. This is a non-randomized study, but it, it compares physical education using standard curriculum in schools in Montreal against a bunch of schools that elected to use or incorporate a circus arts-based approach into their pedagogy. So the physical education teachers were trained in the incorporation and use of circus arts as an alternative paradigm to a standard physical education curriculum. And so what we were interested to do as researchers was compare the children on measures of physical literacy, which we now have greater confidence in capturing at least aspects of physical literacy with the tools that we have, whether the children in the circus arts instruction program did better in terms of improvements in things like motor competence, motivation, enjoyment, relative to the children in standard curriculum. What's kind of interesting about this study, well, there's many things that's interesting about this study. I'm biased, of course, but, but one, of the, one of the things that I think is worth pointing out is that the play tools were created to measure physical education curriculum. So really what they're doing is, 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 is a measure that's consistent with standards for physical education. It's really important to note in this study that the circus arts design element of it was not using standard physical education curriculum. In other words, we weren't teaching children the things that are required to do better on the 18 items on play fun. They were just learning circus arts. Hold that in your mind when you see the results in a moment. So I think I've described that before. We've got lots of pictures. Dean has better videos of what a classroom can look like when the focus is on circus arts. And I encourage you to seek out Patrice and Marco and Dean and myself to give you some more insight into actual, the actual pedagogy and what was, what was done here. I don't have time to go into it in detail. But we did look at a program that uh, derived activities from all of the five major schools of circus and compared that with trained teachers to physical education teachers delivering standard provincial curriculum. And what you can see here is that the circus um, uh, uh, programs are, are, are indicated here um, in, uh, oh, sorry, boys and girls are indicated here. Girls are, are green, at least by my eyes, and, and boys are blue. I hope I got that right, yes. And what you see is SPE refers to schools that use standard physical education curriculum versus the circus curriculum delivered in the context of physical education. So if you focus on the first part of the graph where it says baseline, what you see is pretty well no differences between boys and girls in each of the programs at baseline on play fun. So they were similar. We do see differences between boys and girls in the results on play fun and quite a substantial difference, which we've seen actually replicated many times with play fun data in different contexts. If you shift over to the other side of the panel, you see the results after the intervention has occurred. So these are administrations of play fun after the kids have experienced standard physical education curriculum versus circus-based ones. And what really jumps out to me is a couple of things. Number one, overall, boys and girls are doing better on play fun that were exposed to circus, and quite substantially better. What's also of interest to me, though, is look at the difference between boys and girls. The gap in play fun is pretty well maintained when the physical education curriculum is the, out is the intervention. For circus, the differences between boys and girls have been minimized. And again, from other literature, that's something that's worthy of further explanation. Is it actually the case that the physical uh, circus-based approach to physical literacy not only improves motor competence, but minimizes gender or sex differences in motor competence. And if that's true, then that's something that's really, really valuable because we know the cost of sex differences in motor competence later for participation in physical activity, especially during adolescence. Now, we see exactly the same pattern of results with the motivation and effective domains measured by play self. So it's not only improvements in motor competence, they enjoyed it more, and they were more intrinsically motivated to participate as a result of their participation in circus. Does that mean that circus is the answer to everything? Well, yes, Patrice and Dean would say yes, 
But I think what it means is that if we take something that is more aligned with the principles of physical literacy, like circus r space instruction, we see not only general improvements in motor competence, a potential minimization of sex differences, and improvements in those psychosocial domains of physical literacy, remember that we were measuring motor competence that's standard physical education curriculum. Even though they weren't doing things that should have improved their overhand throw, their overhand throw was getting better. Powerful evidence for a potential role for physical literacy. Matt Kwan is a assistant professor at McMaster University and a former postdoc of mine. He's been interested for a long time in the transition from high school to university because we know when university students, especially if they go away, they get the freshman 15, which means they gain weight, and they also don't participate. Their physical activity levels drop off precipitously. And for most of them, they never get it back. That's one of those critical inflection points when we look at life course data on physical activity participation. So he reasoned, why don't we use a physical literacy-based approach to see if we can attenuate or mitigate the drop in physical activity that occurs during that transition to first year university. And importantly, from a physical literacy perspective, let's not make any assumptions about movement skills or competence and confidence that university students might have. And what they put them through was a, a, an eight-week program that involved a whole lot of different activities. The video doesn't work over here, but what they were doing was setting up a life-size human version of Hungry Hungry Hippo. So you have the wheelbarrow, you have the barrel, and you go in, you try to scoop as many balls as you can. They played water polo, and they even experimented with adapted games, so you could get a sense of what it would be like to play different games at different levels of abilities. And it was all done in the context of the, edu of, of the university setting, so either in residence or in, or in gyms. Multiple environments, multiple games. They played other kinds of game-based activities. And what we saw in that data was that not only were there improvements in motivation and competence and confidence in terms of being physically active, but their motor competence improved on play fun as well. The final thing I'll talk about really, really quickly is what I think could be a whole new area of inquiry. So we've talked about measurement, we've talked about um, uh, intervention, but we could also talk about what I might call physical literacy epidemiology. And we've written a bit about this, and you've seen this model before a couple of times, so I'll just show it really, really quickly. If it's true that physical literacy is a gateway to physical activity, which means it is a determinant of physical activity, and we know that physical activity produces positive physiological, sociological, and psychological adaptations that confer significant health benefits across a number of different health outcomes, whether we're talking non-communicable chronic diseases, physical and mental, we know there's positive associations with physical activity, then it might be possible to think about physical literacy as a fundamental determinant, not only of physical activity, but of health through its benefits in physical activity. And that would very much be an epidemiological approach. We were able to show evidence for the pathways, some of the pathways, that connect these things together, but no one has yet tested a comprehensive model like this, or thought about the design of studies that might show more potent, powerful connections between physical literacy and health outcomes. And I am really interested in um, extending some of that work to think about not only, ooh, not only mental health, or not only chronic diseases, but mental health in particular. Okay, so where are we all at here? Well, I think empirical, pragmatic work in physical literacy is increasing, and I expect it will continue to do so. Because there are still big questions, and there are evidence demands that have not yet been addressed. Does this mean the idealism is dead? Of course it doesn't. These things can and should, these perspectives, coexist amongst other. We can learn immensely from the scholarly and philosophical inquiry into this very interesting concept that has gripped so many of us. But we need to embrace, I think, a multidisciplinary and multi-perspectival approach to physical literacy if we truly want to be true to the true nature of the construct. Thank you. <laughs>